You're listening to Two Beers Until Phrenesis, a podcast where we discuss the ideas of philosophy, ethics, religion, history, and culture. Alongside regular guests and friends, we discuss some of life's big questions over a few beers. Enjoy. Once again, Sam, you've read or learned something and you've rushed to tell me about it. I really like these episodes where you just tell me Bucks. things. Bucks. Literally, I know nothing about you, though. Um, I was going to wait until I started learning judo again because I, I used to do a little bit of it, um, but I was shit at it. That was years ago. I was going to say, so you must know a little bit about judo then. How long were you doing judo for? I was a yellow belt. So that's basically what you get for just turning up after a, a few weeks. See, <laughs> it's just like, that. thank you. Nah, that's not true. A yellow belt is a valuable member of the judo community. I think I did get a couple of stripes on it as well. So like I did, I was, I was sort of like going on the steps for the next one, but I stopped really early. I've really wanted to carry it on because I, I, I work in a bar uh, and self-defense would be really handy, but I think it's, it's about other things as well. Like we're going to probably talk about like self-discipline and exercise and yeah, it's, it's not just about like, Oh, I can also throw people where I work. It's like, no, it's, it's it, yeah, it, I think it's a lot more, that's and that's the, that's the kind of thing uh, the kind of thing that's cool so so what I looked at was a book it was called Mind Nova Muscle by Jigoro Kano and annoyingly there's also a book by Ant Middleton called Mind Nova Muscle that's all about you know being in the SBS and being in the boats teams because it's a cool sounding title but he was like one of the guys who he was credited as being the guy who founded judo and then also was like instrumental in making it like the national sport of Japan and making it uh, be accepted as part of the Olympic sports. So get moving it up and sort of moving it as like a higher tier of prestige as a sport. So that was Olympic sports stuff was in the 1960s. Yeah. Well, it was, it, it started from what I read, it started in the 1880s. So he was born in 1860 and then the actual sort of movement of him being allowed on the board of like people who, helped decide things for Olympic sports was around 1920. So just before the Second World War. And also this was a sort of weird period in history where uh, nations were becoming super nationalist. You had the rise of like nationalism in Germany. Uh, Japan had a very, very nationalist and very militaristic sort of bent going on. There's a really cool uh, series of podcasts by uh, Dan Carlin, Hardcore History. And it talks about, you know, Japan's role in the Second World War and how, you know, like they they basically fought a war with Russia and then after that they went super militaristic and super like uh basically just racist and you know like mm, nationalistic yeah. and how in the same way the Nazis were thinking they were like the master race, that's what Japanese people were saying, and then they did all sort of things like invade China and commit some severely horrible war crimes in the name of like supremacy, like racial supremacy. Mm. Uh, can I give you? Call? Yeah, I'm just getting a phone call. Uh, look, I don't have any yeah. fucking friends. I don't have any friends, right. Connor. I take, sit, take the phone call. Connor, take I phone sit call. in a room. Give me one sec. Take the phone call. He's got push to talk on, so I, I can't hear what he's saying at the moment. So uh, I'll, I'm going to leave this in the podcast, but he's just taking a phone call. The very start of the podcast. Do you know what? I don't have any fucking friends. <laughs> uh, I, I've spent I've spent the last, like, you know, I spent the last seven months in lockdown, sat in a room of my own, eating rice, reading books about fucking judo. Then as soon as I do something when I've been recorded, suddenly everyone comes fucking crawling out the woodwork. Who was it? It was me dad. Ah, uh, that's all right. It was, it, yeah, it was my get dad. Get on. <laughs> uh, get him on. Hey dad, what do you know about Jigoro Kano? And he goes, oh, I used to go do bowls with Jigoro Kano. <laughs> Should we start with this guy's sort of biography do you have much on yeah dude i have a little bit so um what do you want to know about his like life before he got into ju- uh, judo and everything like that yeah from so from what i understand this is japanese so he, he was born in japan, <laughs> yes. in japan. <laughs> uh, yeah good start um and i know he studied english i know his father was an official in the the sort of shogunate and uh his son his father was a son of a Shinto priest and his mother was the daughter of the owner of a sake company. So I know this is basically coming from a quite a traditional background. 
And that's going to contrast with some of the changes that were happening in Japan as he was growing up because it was kind of the turn into this, uh, I guess, more westernized kind of Japan that we now recognize today. And that martial arts was was at odds with that. I think it was the it was the Meiji Restoration, right? That was when so there was sort of periods of history where Japan just completely shut off its borders and became very like insular and didn't want to trade with anyone. And then there was periods, for example, like the Americans' famous gunboat diplomacy, where they just turned up with ships and were like, trade with us or we're going to fucking basically destroy your navy, destroy your country. I think that was a good couple of years after that. So that was in that period, which I think is called the Meiji Restoration. Okay. So yeah, his dad was um his dad was apparently super duper strict and he would come home and be like, you know, getting him to train sort of martial arts and like study and do things like that. Well, I know he wanted to learn jujitsu for a very long time, but the, the climate didn't really allow for that. So he was trying to find teachers for like fucking ten years because there's a massive like load of bullying because his yeah, yeah. his parents were like part of this more traditional background and as as Japan was kind of changing like he was kind of worried about bullying so he wanted to learn a bit of jiu-jitsu and stuff and uh, apparently part of it was that his dad was absolutely jacked so like his dad his dad was massive <laughs> and like one of the first things i looked up i looked a little bit about his like um like his child and stuff and one of the only stories i got about his dad is that he would pull up his yamaka and show his um show his calves and quads <laughs> 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 that's like one of the only stories about his dad so his dad was like this super strict dude who occasionally would just like pull up his traditional like japanese clothes just to show how fucking jacked his legs were yeah that's awesome if that's the one imagine that being your lineage like your legacy right nothing no one remembers anything else about you apart from the fact you used to get your legs out it's not bad so apparently, like a lot of the traditional martial arts teachers, jujitsu and all kinds of other martial arts were either disillusioned or like completely. I'm really uh, congested, by the way. If anyone fucking realizes that my voice sounds totally different, I've got a massive block nose. Um, well, but, that's yeah. that's something to edit out. <laughs> yeah, well, just so that people know. But um, yeah, apparently, a lot of these martial arts teachers. Uh, like incredibly disillusioned or forced out of their practices because it wasn't economically viable and it took him like 10 years to find stuff. So when he did eventually find stuff, how did that sort of turn out? Do you, have you got any stuff on that? Or Yeah, yeah. So so the, the martial art that he learned was jiu-jitsu. So jiu-jitsu's, and there's sort of two different spellings. There's the Brazilian jiu-jitsu and there's Japanese jiu-jitsu. And jiu-jitsu started out as like sort of last, you know, like last line defense, if you were like a samurai on the uh, battlefield. So there was lots of like horrible things, you know, like it was very focused around like eye gouging, testicle ripping, um, other things like joint locks, uh, mm. chokes, things like that. So something to permanently disable an enemy. And the things that have been kept are things like joint locks and you know, like chokes, submission holds, these sort of things. Part of it was to first of all, control your opponent for a couple of seconds so that you can draw like a small dagger and then stab them or, you know, choke them out or break their legs or like hold them so that another member of the battlefield could, you know, like come in and stab them as well. So it wasn't like a striking sport or anything like that because they thought by the time, you know, you've lost your spear, you've lost your sword, whatever, there's no point in throwing punches because the other guy's probably going to have a sword and you're probably going to be unarmed. So he, he went into doing this sort of, uh, he went into learning this style of traditional Japanese jiu-jitsu and it's taught in two ways. So one of them is the kata and the second one is randori. So kata is like the form, you know, like the, uh, the again, this is sort of thing that we kind of, because I do um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu and it's sort of, kata is almost like a sort of, it's almost like a bit of a joke, right? It's almost like a meme because it's like the karate kid image of, you know, like practicing punches where you go to punch them in the stomach, they bend over and your next move is based on their movement. You know, like you predict, it's almost like a dance. It's like a form that you practice. Right, yeah. So so obviously, because you can't, you can't go in and be like, cool, today boys were practicing eye gouging because, you know, you've got two lessons where you can do that successfully, yeah. where you can drill that. So a lot, a lot of the intense stuff you couldn't train. So you just couldn't train like testicle ripping and like eye gouging and things. So that was the kata. And then the other section was randori. And randori was like free practice. It was like basically 
uh, what we in jiu-jitsu call rolling, uh, what you'd call in boxing like sparring. And it's like live practice against a resisting opponent where you're both using uh, what in judo is called waza. Waza is like uh, an attack, like a movement, an attack on the opponent. You're trying to use your waza on them and they're trying to do the same to you. So that allows, you know, like a more uh, practical, more successful sort of martial art because you're both improving rather than sort of what happened in the 1990s where there was like this big karate boom and then the UFC happened and then people very quickly found out that the most effective forms of martial arts were things like, you know, boxing, uh, kickboxing, jiu-jitsu and wrestling because you had someone doing all, all this like monkey kung fu and then they were just yeah. getting d- double leg takedown, punch in the face and headlocks and then just like choked out. So it was very, very quick to sort of, a lot of these traditional martial arts just sort of slowly started moving away and, and started, people realized that they were less practical than the Carters said they were. So how does this really differ from jiu-jitsu and, and I guess why does this differ? So I can't remember the other guy. I think it's uh, Fushin Ryu is the guy. So there's weird, there's like a weird, almost like cyclic thing. So jiu-jitsu was like the original, which I think jiu-jitsu stands for the gentle art, which is like absolutely fucking hilarious. If you've ever been to a jiu-jitsu gym and you see like a, like a heavyweight guy literally shoulder leading all of his weight onto someone's jawbone muscles. I think it's kind of like ironic, right? But it's about using your, and, and this is sort of going to do is about using your body weight and things effectively. And then, so that's the office jiu-jitsu. Then Shigoro Kano came over and he focused a lot more on elements like throws, like takedowns, and you're not using your opponent's strength against them. And then this became judo. Yeah. And then Fushin Ryu uh, sort of went back and then looked at, you know, how we can apply elements of judo. And also like, other practitioners took elements of judo and then thought about how they could counter it. So it's like sort of almost like a cyclic thing where jiu-jitsu was dominant. Then the answer to jiu-jitsu was judo. So just someone going, okay, well, if you're going to do this, I'm just going to throw you. And then the answer to judo was someone uh, then sitting down. So like playing like in the guard, like starting on the floor, taking away the main strength of judo of being thrown onto the floor, taking away that dynamic element. And then that's where... Uh, Count Maeda, who was sort of as part of the diplomatic envoy, or I can't remember, he had some connections where he went to Brazil. Then he taught the ground aspect uh, to people like Hilo Gracie in Brazil. And that's where Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, sort of the modern Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, has come from. Yeah, because I've seen that uh, it kind of spawned a lot of other uh, derivative martial arts. Like, obviously, yeah, BJJ. Um, Sambo, RAB. Yeah, the weird, the weird thing is, it's kind of like you know a um, you know like an origin. You know, like all these different nations have sort of very similar origin stories. You know, like all these different like origin myths. It's kind of like that. There are just some things that work. Is it biology where like things will eventually congregate towards like a successful model, even if they start in completely different ways? So you know, like a a shrew and what's the example? It's like a shrew and a mouse or something are like basically the same, but they come from completely different families. But like, there's just effective ways of, you know, taking people down and choking them out and breaking arms or whatever. Well, I know that an elephant shrew has basically the same genetic structure as an elephant in comparison to a mouse. Uh, but but it, I, I guess it's evolved in a way that's served its purpose. And it, it basically, for all intents and purposes, is a mouse. Yeah, that's something I'm sure I'm sure there's a word for it. I'm sure there's a word for it, but it's where we need nine. We need to have like a nine hot doll. We just text okay. text him that he sends back a, a two word text with the answer of it. It is this. Yeah. So but basically functionality is is what you're talking yeah. about. Uh well I was just I was just gonna say, uh, I think that a lot of this has uh, more than functionality, because I think it kind of couples with some Confucian ideas. Taoism as well, lots of Taoism. Yeah, Taoism. And uh, the more kind of practical stuff. I mean, it's a philosophical worldview as much as it's a practical thing. And the two aren't necessarily even separate. We kind of see it embodied in like vague ideas like sportsmanship. I, right, so 
most of my notes basically focused on this idea that I picked up on straight away, which is that the, the sort of judo philosophy is it, it, a very common thing with Eastern traditions in that like th- th- there's a more practical element to it. But I think that it's something that's quite alien to Western philosophy. As, as in like, you know, you, you achieve the way. So like, but through training where you do through the mastery of something. Yeah. And I, I guess like holistic or existential might be words that we could use to unpack that. But really, I think yeah, just go and do it. Like it, I, I feel like the Western tradition with its let's con just hasn't armed us effectively to deal with a lot of these Eastern stuff. It's like the whole Easternization Orientalism bollocks. It's like, we don't fucking understand the, 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 like what's going on with a lot of these Eastern traditions because we don't really get practical philosophy anymore. Yeah. So we, we don't, we don't do philosophy. It, it's not a, it's not like a, it's not a verb. And then it's something they talk about. And then you just do, it seems to often be detached from like how people live. So it's like, you'll, you'll talk about all this stuff and then just, you know, go and do what you're going to do anyway without having that impact you in any way. Yeah. So like, I think there are close parallels in the Western traditions, but I think we reserve the word philosophy for maybe like, I think when we think of philosophy in the West, it's Eastern meditation, sitting on a fucking cloud thinking about bollocks, or it's the romantic European poetry. It's like, oh, thinking about life's big questions. Or maybe if you've studied a bit, it, you might think, oh, it's logic. It's, it's this analytic stuff. But I don't think we're comfortable using like verbs and doing actions when we're talking about philosophy. And I think that was kind of what I was trying to say in like the last couple of podcasts with the, like talking about food and stuff. I think we've compartmentalized everything a bit too much. So we tend to think of like actions and thought is two different things. It's like, well, they're, they're all, it's all the same. So like, if you know, it, it basically, if you're trying to like roll someone on a mat, I think it is basically an intellectual and moral exercise at the same time. And I think it almost kind of speaks to, like, this is a bugbear I get with like people since I, since I graduated, they're like, Oh, what can you do with philosophy? It's like, yeah. it's like, I, I, I get it. I get what you're trying to ask. And yeah, obviously I'll just answer it normally. It's fine. If I sit there and think about it, really, I think what you're asking me is you're thinking of philosophy a bit like film design. And it's it's not really, I think philosophy isn't really like that. We're going to have to have a bit longer of a conversation. I don't want to sound like a twat, but I, I do I do think you're thinking of it like, oh, it's film design. And that is something that happens in a separate context. So like, oh, now I can use my film design degree when I'm doing film design related things later in life. but Really, if you're using a philosophy degree, you're using it all the time, you're using it at work, you're using it with friends, you're using it constantly. Yep. So I don't think people think quite that broad anymore, or maybe they never did or whatever, but I still think it's, it's about lifestyles and relationships. And I think that that whole thing is very alien to us. So I think that's probably one of the most important things to understand about judo is was, was the crux of like what I thought reading a lot of this stuff anyway. Well, that it's like a, you know, it's a practice and a philosophy at the same time. Yeah. And I, and I don't think the two, the like practice and philosophy need to be separated. I, I literally just think that it, it, it's just, it's a practice that kind of encourages this, these ideas of like these virtues, I guess, of, of discipline and study and the idea that you can come to an idea through constant practice and you can refine an art it, it comes back to your boy Yamoto Masashi where it's Amazing like that. you know the, yeah yeah the ways and train I fucking yeah I love I love a bit of Masashi quotes because it's just yeah it was it, it's a real fucking red pill right it's just really cool it, so he talks about you know the way the way being in training and the way being in like all aspects of your life again the fucking quote that I'm gonna get tattooed on my just like eyes and face <laughs> Or once you know the way broadly you see it in all things. I think it's become your your catchphrase. Oh, it just is. But it generally is. Once you once you develop an area of expertise and then you start looking for those links, they're just fucking everywhere. Everything's connected. I think one of the biggest fallacies that we get told in 
the West or whatever, or, or like an education system is that things aren't connected, that things are like specialized. And obviously you, you can go down the path of specialization until something is super, super specialized. But like at the sort of level that I operate at, everything is connected and you can understand something else more or you can understand something else more by relating other things to it. So it's like you can talk, you can talk about, uh, you know, like planning and jujitsu. You can talk about jujitsu and like musical composition. You can talk about painting and writing music. Just the, you know, the Brett Weinstein thing or Eric Weinstein, I can't remember which one, but like, you know, master of master of one, connector of none. Uh, the other one, <laughs> <laughs> master of one, connector. All right, master of one, connector of one. Yeah. Something else, you know, just some 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 fucking cool phrase about connecting things. You sent me uh, a few little things about uh, connecting what you learn on the the mat to. Oh yeah, dude. What you learn in life. Uh, I really like those. Actually, you were talking about like um, some moral lessons and like. Let, let me let me let me find the quote. There's a really there's a really good quote which um. Which talks about this. Talking about uh, humility and uh, sportsmanship as well. Oh yeah, hundred percent. But there's a really good thing with it talks about how it's a more effective way of learning moral lessons as well. Yeah, yeah. So here it is. Uh, moral lessons are, that are learned in the classroom are often based on abstract ideas and stories, but moral lessons that can be acquired through judo randori are based on facts. I love that. So like. Yeah, you, you get a small guy and you go up to him, you're the big guy, and you think, you know, oh, yeah, I'm going to throw this guy through the wall. And he fucking flips you on your ass. Yeah. You have you have just got a serious lesson in humility based on facts. Yeah, right? yeah, that's that's what I was thinking. Is it like, you obviously always say about narcissism and ego, how it's like, this is such a good remedy for it. And I think, I think that's why people don't want to do it nowadays. Nothing will reduce your ego more or like or make you more aware of it or help you out of it more than getting fucking choked out by like a 16 year old yellow belt assassin who's like 50 kilograms. Yeah. And they just put you in a fucking knot and just choke you to death. And you're like, okay, guess I guess I learned something here today. Because it destroys that like super relativist idea of like, oh, everyone's right. Or like, it's just like, no here is just one example of someone being right in this particular context, at least. And you, you just accept that with dispassion. And I think people are afraid of sort of taking that path. They don't want to, it's like when people don't want to learn guitar because they can only, they only know one scale and they don't want to bother. It's just like, ah, oh, three chords. Oh, I can't play guitar. Yeah. yeah. And they, they go around telling everyone I can't play guitar. No, you, you, you just, you're just shit. You are just shit at the moment. But like, through patience and practice, you you can become great, and that's the other side of it. It's like if you just commit to this this craft, it's like saying I'm a musician or an, I'm an electrician. It's like you're you're fucking sticking to an idea, and and yeah, and you're developing that idea. Well, it's like, and also another aspect of humility, which I think is cool, is like you'll see, you'll see. First of all, you'll see yourself get better by doing more of that art. Yes. Right. Yeah, exactly. so every time, every time you get choked out, every time you roll with someone better than you, every time you get beaten up, every time you go in and go, Oh, that's fucking annoying. Let's learn something about this. You see yourself developing and it's not through like magic. It's not because you've got an innate better skill. It's just because you've put in the hard work. And it's, what's really cool is like, you see someone who's putting in uh, more hard work than you and they'll start like later than you. And then they'll sue me better than you. And you're like, okay, that's another humility check, right? Yeah, yeah. They've just, they've just, they've put in the effort. And, you know, there's a, there's a good old saying in jiu-jitsu, which is that a black belt is just a white belt that hasn't quit. And it's so, yeah, it's just, yeah. At, at some point, everyone was shit. Everyone was bad. And the only way to become a stud is to be a fucking pud for hours and hours and hours and just get beaten up. No matter what that is, if that's playing like fucking terrible violin, if that's, you know, uh, learning how to fucking drive or whatever it is, it's just like you have to go through that as like part of your process, part of your stages. Yeah. And unless unless you throw up your hands and go, oh, do you know what? Fuck this. I don't want to do this. And then that's all that is, is you admitting defeat. 
before it's even began. It's like that Sun Tzu quote that I've been like I've been banging on about for ages, which is uh, all defeats before death are merely psychological. If you play this scale on your guitar and you get it wrong, cool, you quit. Well, then you first of all you've actually just in that in that path of skill development you've literally just killed yourself right you've just stopped you've gone dead so that is death yeah but if you do it wrong and you get it slightly wrong and you fuck it up do you know what I mean that's just a psychological setback and then you get up and you do it again and then you'll progress a little bit further down it i was thinking about um i often get especially since i started studying uh at i guess um master's level well i did get it at undergrad as well you get this charge of things being vocational and you often get that, that. We, we talked about that since the start of this podcast um the idea of particular skills being vocational and I, I do think that just completely destroys the inherent worth of certain skills you can you can take so take the idea of being a plasterer you just go okay that's just good for for plastering it's not yeah, yeah. no no i work in a bar like fucking 50 percent of the people that come in are fucking plasterers. They work on scaffolds all day. It's like they've got working class values, value for money. They've got a skill. They've got a trade. They've got an insight into construction as a practice and an industry. And they play. They, it's like the, when they're putting up a building, or whatever. It's like you play a part in a wider whole, and you get to appreciate that. So okay, you could do some plastering at home. That's like that's like when people say, okay, okay, philosophy. You get research skills. And you can apply those to other subjects. It's like, well, that's like saying, okay, you're a plasterer. And I guess from that, you could learn to become an electrician. It's like, that's that's really not getting at the the whole nature of the skill. It's like, that's so narrow. Have you seen a good plasterer doing plastering? They're like... F- they're like fucking magicians, mate. Honestly, yeah, yeah. It's it, and it's like you, it's like you watch someone who's. And this is what's cool about like. This is why I don't know. It's probably you know like you're talking about stoicism and like some Taoism. Like you find the philosophy that sort of fits the way your brain goes anyway. But it's just like you watch someone. Uh, I mean, he talks about this again in the flow state with the butcher who cuts up the cow, and you know, a normal butcher would have to go through like six or seven knives a year, and this guy has still got the same knife because he's working with the meat because he's like an artist because he's in the flow state when you watch like a plaster doing some plastering it looks so fucking elegant and so easy and because they've just got such a way because they've spent so long doing this and they're in such a flow state when they're doing it and then you try and do plastering and you're like literally just like throwing poo at a wall <laughs> and and they'll just and they'll just come in just like throw throw this plaster on the wall and they have like this perfect smooth finish and these like brilliant of course, like they would never be like, oh, this is like a Taoist thing. This is like a, you know, this is a practice of the way. Talk, talking like Yamato Masashi. But they, I guarantee they have the same feelings as Yeah, that. I bet a lot of the stuff we're talking about in mysticism, that sort of transcendental state. I bet some plasterers get that with, with plastering. Like, Well, that, that, that's that Harry and Paul sketch, right? Where they're, those, those two people fishing and they're talking about, one of them's talking about all these like crazy, like deep artistic things. And he goes, oh yeah, all some sort of shit. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the thing with that's the and I think that, that uh, you know that's probably got at the uh, the conceit of like a lot of academic tradition is kind of no, like, yeah, 100% wrapped right? up a lot of this stuff in like fucking complex language and it's like what you don't understand is that most people like you talk about ethics or whatever like virtues or like fucking transcendental stuff with theology and it's like it, most people are just doing that anyway you're just you're just making up fancy words for it it's like you want to have a real conversation chat to someone in a pub like straight away you'll you'll understand what they do and I, I think it doesn't go without saying in some circles because I but I think that is a misconception or a misunderstanding of sort of academia and intellectualism when it becomes that abstract. You know what I mean? It's it's not just clever people, obviously, that have the monopoly on experience and understanding of religious and philosophical concepts. Parenthood would be like a massive counter to that. Like academia is a very good route. It's one I would recommend, but it's not necessarily the way to gain the comprehension on those things. It can certainly indicate intelligence and willingness, but it you know it didn't exist for thousands of years, and people didn't just suddenly stop apparently being stupid by virtue of one single flawless type of institution being founded. 
It sounds obvious, but hey ho. Very often, imagined conceptual differences are basically just vocabulary or the context of it being in a thesis. It's not actually a different concept. It's just you've put it in a philosophy paper. Well, yeah, you know, like when we were talking about like flow states and things like that, and the examples weren't like weren't like fucking logic puzzles or like all this crazy stuff. It was just like, here's a bloke who works at a factory. He makes one particular part. There was a really cool thing. Um, I was watching Guy Martin and there was a video of this dude who like, he makes parts for like nuclear power plants. He's like a, a Japanese master of like cutting cylinders and he makes cylinders. That's it. He makes cylinders and he makes them like within like thousands of microns using a lathe, using like hand and eye. And he literally listens and he hears when it's the right thickness and it's to the like thousands of microns. Like it's the smallest measurement you can have. And he hears that because that's his thing. He just makes cylinders and through that he lives philosophy in the same way that judo practitioners do this in the same way that different like buddhists do that through meditation yeah, i think everybody lives philosophy it's just people that think yeah, about yeah. overthink yeah. philosophy i think it's academics that overthink philosophy they're the only people that don't live philosophy in in, in, some, in some ways <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah fuck those dude I, I don't know yeah i get it I, I understand that it's just well philosophy is living right it's it, it i think there's lots of problems with like academia in itself just, you know, becoming an industry and becoming a, you know, like a reservoir for people to make up words. And it, it, beca- it becomes, it becomes like a game, right? It becomes like a, I can't remember what it's called. It's like a isolated, it's an isolated system where like uh, yeah. the people within that bubble just do academia stuff. Yeah. Uh, like the main problem, I, I think, I think some of the people in academia are some of the Best philosophers. I, I don't. Actually, I'm not. I'm, I mean, I'm. Be, I'm using hyperbole, and I'm, I, you know, I'm kind of. Um, I'm not, I don't want to shit on them too much. I don't want to shit them at all. Really, it's just, there's only two things I really want to shit on them about, and this is the idea that academia is inherently useful. And I see a lot of. I mean, granted, most of it is through Twitter, but I do see a lot of academics thinking that what they're doing is uh, like of inherent worth to the wider world it's like eh, is it like well I, I think the world the world would be a much better place if everyone trained jiu-jitsu or judo because like there'd be so much like less aggression because you know you wouldn't have anything to prove because your outlet is with other skilled individuals in like a in like a safe environment where you're competing against other good people Do you think there's not a bad part, a bad side of martial arts at all? Do you not think it can be misused uh, or there's like a bad culture? I think, yeah. There's there's some bad culture. Jiu-Jitsu is crazy. Like as a as a martial art, it's the, so here's a really sick thing about judo, right? If you were in a judo competition, me and you, we're fighting, doing some judo. You throw me. I end up on my back. You win. And then you go, Yes. And you do like a little celebration. Not even that. You just, you smile. You sort of move over me. Whatever. You're DQ'd. You're di- you're disqualified. Oh really? I think that's fucking sick. How cool is that? That like you know you beat me and you go yes and you just go cool. You're DQ'd now because that's that's not like part of the judo code. You shouldn't be like you know you shouldn't be like showing off or be like happy about it it's just like you know so why is that is that because it's unsportsmanly or it's un, it's yeah it's unsportsmanly and uh jigoro kano was also saying you know like if there was ever a fight between like a ju- uh, judoka which is the guy who does judo or like a boxer it would either be one of the same rules and no judo practitioner should ever be involved in anything that's like uh, you know like showmanship or sportsman like you know, like a UFC or like a, a WWE or like something something like that. But then you look at jujitsu and then you see like people tapping some out and they're like ripping their fucking gear off and like screaming and punching and you know like all the crowd is literally just like up up in their seats like banging seats and jumping. So jujitsu is just jujitsu tournaments are just crazy. Yeah. Whereas judo is just very very like disciplined and a lot of it is about the mental aspects as well as like the physical performance because I think jujitsu has less 
it has less like clear codifying of what is expected mentally and spiritually than something like judo where Jigoro Kano puts it in some sort of clear terms. What do you value as the as the difference? Like, well, I mean, what, what makes well, that so, what so, makes that good? Is I guess what I'm asking. So, so we so we so we got like a so I was like talk about how Jigoro Kano splits it up. So he's got like yeah. this quote. He says, "Since the very beginning, I've been categorizing judo as three parts. So I'm going to fuck up all these pronunciations, but Rentai Ho, Shubo Ho." and Soshin Ho. Rensai Ho refers to Judo as a physical exercise. Shobin Ho is Judo as a martial art. And Sushin Ho is the cultivation of wisdom and virtue, as well as the study and application of the principles of Judo in our daily lives. So he's, he's, one, of the, he's one of the practitioners, that, or one of the few practitioners I've seen so far that says, look, there's three clear, distinct categories, right? There's the physical exercise, there's the actual effectiveness of it as a martial art, and there's the fact that we're taking the things that we have found out through the martial art and applying them to, you know, like our daily lives. Right. So he says here, like, uh, through, through training in the attack and defense and techniques of judo, the practitioner nurtures their physical and mental strength and gradually embodies the way of judo. Uh, thus, the ultimate objective of judo and discipline is to be utilized as a means of self-perfection and therefore a way to make a positive contribution to society. Anyone who does not take the application and the elements of judo and apply them to their physical life is not truly mastering judo. If I'm doing jiu-jitsu and I think, oh, okay, like a flanking maneuver, right? Like I'm trying to get a, a, an arm lock. So what I'll do is I'll pretend to go for a choke and then maybe get an arm lock. So you defend one thing and you get another. And then if I go, oh, that was an effective sport jujitsu technique, but I don't use that in other aspects of my life. So like if I'm, you know, in a conversation with someone and I, and I, and I want one outcome, I'll, I'll set it up so that it seems I'm going after one thing. So they'll fall back to the other one. That's the same, you know, practical application, right? Right. But you have to make that link. So there's no point. <coughs> <laughs> fucking easy. Sorry. There's no point. There's no point learning all these really awesome lessons doing jujitsu. Uh, let's say like economy of force, right? I'm not going to go absolutely crazy and spunk all my energy in the first 20 seconds of a roll in a, five, a six minute round. There's no point learning that and then going, okay, well, when I'm going to, you know, go to work, I'm going to go fucking crazy for the first little bit. And then after that, just crashed. You have to link those, you have to link those elements together. Or else you're just doing a sport. And you're just doing this, and you're just doing that. Whereas it's actually just all things bound together. Do you, do you get a sense of this now with jujitsu? Do you, like, I guess, when you're teaching, or I know you've used a few examples in the past, but this more holistic idea of like contributing to wider society or whatever. Do you, do you still feel that now? What was it he said? The ultimate objective of judo discipline is to be utilized as a means to self-perfection and therefore to make a positive contribution to society. Yes, that. So do you, do you... So, so what's interesting there is, and what I really like about a lot of the, I guess the Stoic philosophers and a lot of what uh, Jigoro Kano talks about is, it, it, he makes it very clear, judo is a discipline to be utilized as a means of self-perfection, right? comma fucking break and therefore to make a positive contribution in society so it's very much sort your shit out yeah use judo and you know use the use the principles of judo to have yourself as sorted out as you can and clean your room and then this yeah clean your room like fucking dr jp says right Put, put your gas mask on before you try and put a gas mask on a kid on a plane. Uh, like Seneca says, if you try and sweep, if everyone swept in, in front of their own door, the streets would be clean. There is room for altruism. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. But like you can't, you can't be giving if you haven't, if, if you're in need, right? Like, like that's why I like the, the much need, but the, yes, yeah, yeah. I, I get the, the general dude, sentiment. Yeah, the, the dude coming down on the plane, right? It's like they always say, put your oxygen mask on before you put the one on your kid. And it's like, cool, you're not going to be able to help your kid if you're fucking suffocating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, I'll tell you how I heard about this. This was, um, this is what got me interested in this sort of book. Um, I listened to a podcast where there was someone talking about um, a guy who was on one of the 9-11 yeah. flights. And he was a judo practitioner. And 
he basically, him and a lot of other people stormed the cockpit. It's a really fucking good intro to a podcast. And they managed to overtake the people and then they crash landed that plane in the ground. So it didn't hit like the a big target. And this guy was uh, posthumously awarded black belt in judo for uh, upholding and fulfilling the highest principles of judo. Yeah. Which I, yeah, I, I listened to that and I was literally fucking tearing up. I just thought that is so fucking sick, right? That a guy literally just, you know, does exactly what he can to try and or how about as many people and sacrifice himself and is recognized. N- not because he does some cool throws or competes in a competition, but has lived judo and the principles of judo in every aspect of his life. Mm. And there was literally a fucking, yeah, there was a statue put up of him. Yeah, judo is cool. Yeah, I guess what I was going to ask is like, uh, have you ever had to use martial arts or do you feel like you embodying the principles has helped you, I don't know, become a better teacher or? Oh yeah, 100%, yeah. Def- definitely not even, I've not had to like fight anyone. But, yeah. the cool, but the good thing about learning martial arts is you don't have to. Like you don't have to, like your likelihood yeah, exactly. of going to fight someone is going to go way down because if someone would to start a fight with you, and then you do like a little quarter turn, you take a stance, that's like, oh shit, I might not, you know, I might not come off well here. There's, there's, you have less to prove. And also sort of people can kind of tell, not that I'm like intimidating at all, but do you know what I mean? It's like, you're also, other aspects of martial arts are like, you know, being situationally aware. So don't, don't hang around in fucking places where you're going to be attacked or bad things are going to happen, right? Or how to defuse a situation using using fucking jujitsu before it happens. Like I saw my favorite fucking thing um, that I've seen, one of the best policing jobs I've ever seen. There was a clip going around when all these American riots started up. And I sent it to Kieran. I go, this guy is a fucking black belt in like verbal jujitsu, right? So it was when there was all these like marches and loads of people were being super angry and there was the sheriff and he was stood in front of this like crowd and there was like a big blue line. And then he goes to people like, hey, look, we're on your fucking side, right? We're, we're here to help you out. We don't want to make this a protest. We want to make this a parade. And then he walks out in front of them and leads the march. Yeah, oh yeah, I saw that. That's, yeah, good shit. Oh my God, completely diffusing. Do you know what I mean? That's some fucking Sun Tzu shit right there, dude. Just completely rephrases the entire conversation. It's no longer like an us and them battle. It's like we are together. That's fucking jujitsu right there. It's philosophy and practice, yeah. Yeah, that's philosophy and practice. That's the gentle art. That's that's a flanking maneuver. That's a fucking... They've put themselves in a joint lock and... yeah. Perfect. I'm, I'm, yeah, sh- I'm awesome. shitting on unis, but like, <laughs> that's the stuff that, it, it, I, you know, I've got, I've got fucking two degrees and that's the stuff that I can't be taught. And that's the stuff that I can't, I would never be able to teach if I did a PhD or whatever. It's like that, that's yeah. where philosophy really is. The thing that puts it all together is doing something. I, I do think doing something like jujitsu where it's like a super, super complicated puzzle solving experience. So it's like, it's very, very like cerebral and it's very physical at the same time. And also one of the best things that it's like helps to teach me, and I'm sure there's much more I can learn as well, but that has already had a fucking huge impact on everything as a whole is the ability to detach emotionally and detach in points of stress. You're probably not going to be more stressed than when you've got a fucking 20 stone dude leaning on your chest, trying to apply an armbar. Mm. But the worst thing you can do in that situation is allow yourself to be stressed and learning how to accept that as a situation, learning how to be mindful in the moment and uh, try and be calm. You realize that being calm is always the right thing to do. It's always going to be more practical. So then when something bad happens, you sort of go into that same state of mind. You've learned, you've practiced how to be calm under stress. You've sort of inoculated yourself against stress by having a fucking dude try and kill you. Yeah, legit. I think, yeah, you you were saying, you were saying that the other day, it was like, well, it doesn't matter what I face, like when I'm I'm teaching or whatever, like once you have that. That's fine. No no one's going to kill you. Yeah, literally. Yeah. Like your benchmark, your benchmark is now like some, most people's benchmark for like bad thing is, you know, like shouting in the street with a stranger, right? That's pretty crap. 
it's not a trained dude. <laughs> it's not a fucking trained 20 stone dude trying to choke you to death using a fucking Japanese dressing gown. So it's like, it just turns, it's, it's, I know it's a bit fight club, right? But it just turns down the volume of everything else. It gives you like a new benchmark. Is this the thing where you like mention Fight Club in literally every? Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, because Fight Club's fucking sick, and I do, I do think Fight Club captures the the narrative of like of things like jujitsu, right? It captures that mentality, which yeah. is hard to define, but is captured somehow in Fight Club. Yeah, and I think I think it is that sort of like camaraderie, right? It's that sort of almost like a sort of warrior spirit where you're just going there and. The teamsmanship and the camaraderie gets insane. It's hard to put a, it's hard to put words to. Yeah, but it's like you've ne- you've never really like you know, you might you might nod at a person if you see them at jujitsu, right? Or if you see them out in, on the streets in real life, you might be like you might give them a nod, you might say hi. But what? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a bit fucking weird. No man, there, there was a guy who who came to jujitsu and said that all the people at his work call him Fight Club now. <laughs> and just go, oh, you're right, Fight, you're right, Fight Club. How you doing? <laughs> Sick. But yeah, so so Jigoro Kano has he says the ability to make decisions quickly and the ability to remain calm and resolute uh, are also good outcomes of learning judo. Uh, the, these abilities will, however, will not be developed by doing kata and randori training without thought. So if you just do loads of random movements and you're not thinking, you're not detaching, you're not being calm, you're not making sensible decisions you're never going to be able to foster those abilities just by, you know, if you never learn judo and you just go and fight someone and you try and get thrown around for four hours a week, you might learn a little bit, but if you think about it, you'll learn a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. Case closed, boys. Train some judo. Literally. Well, I was going to say, I, I want to get back into judo. Is that like getting back into judo for the physicality of it or for the... You know, like we're talking about, like the way, like the mission, like the thing to do. Well, all of it. I mean, I'm a relatively small guy. So, like, if I was going to do any martial art, it would probably be that and throw people around. Because, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not exactly going to square up to somebody like kickboxing is not for you. I would not yeah, like kickboxing. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I'm going to do anything. It's like, oh, I'll just, I'll just sort of like fucking lapse the daisily throw you over there and. But yeah, I mean, I mean, I, that's I mean, that's not what it's for, is it? It's, you know, it, it's it's for the sake of having a craft, which is you know why I've stuck at a couple of instruments and what you know why I, I guess this podcast is kind of a, a craft. You know, I've stuck at it for fucking ages, and there's no real point other than the, the social element, like seeing you guys. Yeah, you know, I, I know there's a couple of guys that really fucking love it on Twitter and stuff, but like. It's it's basically just for me and you guys and like for chatting. Is the point to first of all you learn about like your friends, you learn about what they think, like you learn a huge amount of information because you're listening to someone else's point of view, and also like a big part of it is you're just trying to improve like your ability to talk, your ability to convey ideas, and like you're saying about this is like it is using this as like a method of practicing the way and i think those are everywhere and it's like whether it's like you know shutting the car door uh, maybe i have fucking some undiagnosed condition but it's like <laughs> I, I i'm i'm literally thinking about how to make everything that i do more efficient and more like smooth all of the time no i think that, yeah no i think that's whether that's whether that's making a cup of tea or walking around the table just walking from the front door to my car door with as little movement as possible, a little waste of energy. There's a fine line between craft and obsession. Yeah, I think I think obsession or OCD is probably where we're going into, to be honest, but never mind. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's uh it's interesting anyway. Yeah, yeah. So so he talks about this. He talks about like um fucking hell, this is a long quote. So it says here, when encountering social pressures such as the ones we encounter today. And he was talking about that, you know, in, in the 1920s, whenever it was. So it's nice to know that, you know, throughout history, there's always incredible social pressures going on. We're not special. Everyone always thinks that this is the most turbulent time ever. So when encountering social pressures like the ones we face today, even an incredibly strong-willed person can lose spirit and experience great adversity. This is when he, he must show true character. 
At times like these, the ability to overcome difficulties and endure, be patient and preserve one's honor and spirit and integrity are truly valuable above all else. In order to do this, you must first develop good daily habits. And I was like, fucking sick, man. Yeah, that's, that's on, good on board. Yeah. On board. Just, you know, tick, done. No one's going to have problems with that. Absolutely. That's just like, yes, cool. Ne- next point, please. Yeah, that's super Aristotelian, suggesting that our ethics and virtues start with our habits. Yeah, no, that's good shit. There's also another bit where he talks about, um, talks about broad-mindedness, which is kind of funny because in Judah, there's certain moves that have been you know, made illegal. So for example, in the UFC or wrestling or jiu-jitsu or whatever, there's a thing called the double leg takedown where you basically just like grab them by the legs, throw them on the floor. But in judo, that's illegal. Okay, why? Uh, very good question. Because it's very, very effective. It's a very, very effective move. It's almost too effective and almost would like ruin the, sp- the sport of judo. And that's kind of interesting. Why do you, yeah, it's this weird idea of sportsmanship. Because it's like, do you know what I mean? It's kind of like, hey, look, we're trying to do this way. We're trying to do this the most effective way. And then someone, you know, a wrestler from America goes, oh, I've actually got this really effective thing called a double leg takedown. And they go, no, we won't do that. Yeah, it's a cheat. It's like, what? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's the same thing. There's a thing in jiu-jitsu um, about leg locks. So in jiu-jitsu, the main thing is to get past the, the legs and then you just attack the upper body, right? Um, very, very simplified. But in there's a sort of new movement in no gi where you attack the legs. But in jiu-jitsu, they're banned. Right. What's weird is they're like, in geo, they're saying, okay, we need to be broad-minded. So it says, I'd like to discuss the need for broad-mindedness. Broad-mindedness means the ability to be open to new ideas as well as the ability to organize various kinds of ideas at the same time without mixing them up. And then he talks about like, uh, the reason is this is important is because in the practice of judo, if there's no broad mindedness, people often become overconfident in their beliefs, such as if there's new ideas, uh, they will be superior and will not be taken on board. So it's, it's saying like, be open mind. If new things come up that can help you out, use those new things. Right. Yeah. But, this is, this is but, really isn't the case. But, that, yeah. But then in the sport of judo, some new things come along and then they don't add them in. It's very, very strange. So in jiu-jitsu, I'm guessing there are ways to counter that move. It, is, it isn't a fucking game changer because their their sport is adaptive. Their art yeah, is yeah. adaptive, yeah. So it's kind of like um, about, a fucking hell, let's say like 10 years ago, this whole leg lock thing, right? It was like someone who just fucking, uh, they'd found the cheat codes, right? And then the next seven years was who was the best at doing leg locks and all the competitions were just leg lock, leg lock, leg lock, leg lock. And now people have figured it out. So it's just like another weapon. And then if you put all your skill points in the training, one move and then that doesn't go right, then you've spent less time training the other ones. So it's kind of almost started to balance out where if everyone gets good at it, it just becomes like a regular move, right? It doesn't become like this cheat code. But in judo, they just said, okay, we're just not doing the cheat code. We're not doing the double leg take that. Yeah. Which is very, very weird because it's almost kind of like the, it's almost kind of like going back in time and looking at some of these ineffective martial arts, like they say, like uh, Tai Chi or like some karate stuff or, you know, some elements of judo that don't work. It's just the one, it's just the one where you just like fucking push the air and people fall over. Oh, uh, Dim Mac yeah, is one uh, of them. S- Death Touch. Steven Seagal shit, yeah. Dim Mac, mate. Right? Uh, that's, oh, fucking Steven Seagal does, oh God, what is it? Aikido. Yeah, yeah. Aikido. Aikido is great. There's so many videos of like like Aikido fighter versus MMA guy. And there's a dude doing all this stuff and the guy just fucking clips him. Again, like a, the guy just does a double leg, puts him on the floor and beats the shit out of him. And there's that, you know, I think we talked about before that Chinese guy who, you know, beat up the Kung Fu dude. Just, you know, they came out, double leg take down, knock on the floor and then beat the shit out of him on the floor. Yeah. And there was like a, did you hear that story? There's like the massive yeah, cultural war. Yeah, 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 yeah. Insane, insane. And then like they had this big fight 
and then it was declared a draw because you know Chinese state. But it's, it's interesting, right? The, you know, this this thing of looking back to the past and saying, "Hey, look, we're going to be super innovative, except we're going to sort of ban things that make it too innovative." Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's the difference between heritage and art. It's like art is always trying to innovate and find new avenues, and then heritage is just literally this stagnant thing that just sits there in in the museum. And yeah, yeah I, I don't know. Yeah, I guess that's what confuses me because judo is quite new, and I, I guess I, I always thought judo is much, much more of an art compared to jujitsu. It seems I don't know which one would you say is more practical, or, or is that a silly question to ask? Which one's more practical? Probably, probably jujitsu because like the um, the UFC was sort of created out of this thing called the Gracie Challenge, where basically these skinny Gracie brothers. Just go, hey, look, we'll fight anyone and we'll win. And then they did. And they just used jiu-jitsu, blah, blah, blah. And now it's kind of like, it's less of a factor because loads of people have learned jiu-jitsu. So, because it was this new Brazilian thing, like Brazilian jiu-jitsu, this is not Japanese jiu-jitsu. So, like, because Brazilian jiu-jitsu was kind of new, no one knew how to counter it. Right. And now everyone's so fucking good at Brazilian jiu-jitsu, it's kind of like, Okay, I've got my jiu-jitsu and also what have I got on top of that? It's like everyone's got a good understanding. Whether it's like wrestling or sambo or jiu-jitsu or something, everyone's got a good grappling. Yeah. And like what you saw was like all these different martial arts where you'd have like a, you know, a karate guy and they'd be super specialized and they'd do karate stance and whatever, a uh, kung fu guy. And then kind of now everyone's kind of like this amalgam, right? Where to use Jigoro Kane's word, they've kind of open up their minds, been a bit more minded. They've done away with the bits that don't work and kept the bits which do work. Yeah. So that it's so that mixed martial arts is kind of like all the good bits put together. Mm. Sick. Alright, let's fucking go boy. Alright, so here's here's one cool thing. So he writes about all these sort of different teachings. We can just read off a couple of these because he's quite interesting. One of them is Sakio Tore. So Sakitori is using your Waza, uh, <laughs> Waza. Yeah, no, Waza is fucking great, isn't it? Using your Waza, which is like attack on your opponent before you. <laughs> I've actually written here. I've actually read it. Using your Waza on your opponent before you are Wazad. <laughs> Wazad. Before you are Wazad. <laughs> before you are Wazad. So yeah, that's the like, thing that came yeah. and died, doesn't it? Wazad. Yeah. yeah, that fucking died so quick. Thank God. Thank God. But yeah, like um. So it's like, yeah, be ready to use your attack before that. That's kind of like the the general principle, right? You want to get them before you get you. And you see all these great judo competitions and it's literally like it, they're both on the floor, but one of them hits the floor with their back like a split second before the other. So the other person wins. And it's just like that sort of, that's how fine the game is. And there's another one which is called Shikiro Danko, which is decisive action after con- careful consideration. So that's like, super applicable to life right yeah take it take your time to think about what you're going to do but as soon as you figured out how to do it so think about your throw think about your positioning and then as soon as you're going to go for it go for it 100 percent. don't like you know half ass it go go fucking balls to the wall in that direction do or do not there is no try yeah fuck yeah dude jedi yoda <laughs> dude uh, yeah yoda's just a fucking he's a thief right stole all these he things stole all the Taoist stuff didn't he yeah, literally, Taoism is just fucking cool. I, I like Taoism, but like another one which is funny as well is like uh, this is the this is the antidote, right? So further teaching, which seems contradictory to this, is known as Tomorrow Toroko o Shire, which is uh, basically it's uh, know when to stop. Okay, so it's so it's like you know when you've used your waza up to a certain point and it's unsuccessful, you need to know when to just fucking quit and try something else. You get this all the time in jiu-jitsu where someone's like, I'm going to go for a guillotine choke and they're sat there and like, they'll put it on you. And it's usually, I've got to say, it's usually bigger people who feel like, you know, there's more ego. They've got to, you know, I've got to submit you. And they'll go in for like a triangle or something and they're like squeezing and they've got literally like gritted teeth, you know, and they're, you know, like proper using their energy. They're not doing jiu-jitsu. They're just fucking trying to kill you with their arms or legs. And it's not quite on. It's not on right. And it's not going to get the choke, but they're just like, I'm going to hold on to this for like 30 seconds or whatever. Yeah, super applicable. Yeah. Yeah. And at that point, 
you as the person who's having that put on you, you just wait it out and you just chill. You don't use any energy. The the choke gets burnt out and this person burns up the energy doing something that they shouldn't have been doing, whereas they should have just swapped to the next thing, right? They should have gone, okay, this isn't, you know, have I got this? No. Okay, move on to the next thing. Don't move completely off the path, but like find a different like tributary, find a slightly different way of doing the same thing. Yeah, big time. I thought I thought, uh, I thought that was uh, interesting. yeah. Well, it's it's kind of like what you were saying with the Sun Tzu stuff. It's common sense, yeah. Right? Don't fucking expend all your soldiers attacking the castle if it's not fucking. Yeah, but then how many people do that? You watch like these fucking YouTube debates, and you got like people screaming at each other. And you're like, wait, what are you doing? You're literally you you, you can see like yeah, you, you spend all your energy into a fucking ad hominem or whatever. It's just like yeah, you're yeah, just attacking right. someone's character. You're not attacking them their point and it's just like you're just fucking screaming at a straw man well yeah it's like it's kind of like leadership capital so like no one to spend your energy right and it's like am i going to if i'm if i'm teaching am i going to spend all of my like leadership capital fucking when we're lining up outside because the moment we're lining up outside right before we go into every class because of the corona am i going to spend all of my capital in the five minutes we're lined up there am i going to spend all five minutes you know rushing around making sure no one's blinking making sure everyone's perfect all the time or is it much more efficient for me to just sort of have it happen and then in the last 10 seconds use that energy? Yeah. It's a lot more sensible, right? But then you see some other teachers running up and down and be like, stop doing that, stop doing this, stop doing that. And it's like, first of all, you're you're lowering like your position and also you're just fucking throwing your men at the castle walls. Yeah, the fucking throwing them at the poor They're getting pitch pulled over them. <laughs> legit legit and then you look at like oh actually that was just the strategy for winning world war one <laughs> it's fucking attrition warfare just like literally no one had read sun Tzu where it says yeah don't throw your fucking men into a siege and they just sent you know generations of people to walk at machine guns for no for, for like very little uh like ground to be made literally yeah fucking mental right generally mental Horrible. yeah stupid and then you look that that's that was the and again like once you know the way broadly seeing all things i remember talking to you 13 about doing a um like planning right about how you try and do a thing and this is going back to uh this tomorrow to rogo shire is that fucking jujitsu move where you're trying to go for like a guillotine choke and you can't quite get it off is the same strategy the same level of ego the same level of not wanting to back down on a microcosm as you know the founding problem of world war one yeah, yeah, oh shit, yeah. So it's the same thing, right? And through jiu-jitsu and through anything, you see these, you see these like little microcosms of things. I'm going to talk about it when we're doing planning. So I gave the example of like planning. When you've got a shit plan, but you go, I'm doing this plan and I'm going to go with it. Rather than like slightly adapting it, you're going to stick with this plan. You're going to keep throwing your troops at the walls. You're going to keep choking this person. You're going to go against that rule that, Jigoro Kano talks about it. Yeah. Yeah, common sense. But it's crazy how often you have to reread common sense and then you realize you haven't fucking been doing it at all. I don't think anyone really gets skips with it. Constant struggle. Yeah, it's fucking bullshit, man. I wish I was Sun Tzu. Just <laughs> fucking const- constantly doing the, the common sense thing and then like everyone else is around you going, he's a genius and he's just doing literally like the common sense thing. <laughs> But he, but he's one of the only people who can do it because he's probably detached, like in the in the situation. Yeah, I mean that's, that's the myth, isn't it? Yeah, it didn't even exist, mate. It's a <laughs> myth made up. Sun Tzu was five G. Go listen to our <laughs> podcast on Sun Tzu in series one, where we have a, a shitty little micro. I like that podcast. It was good fun. Yeah, that's good because it was just what, what was cool about that is it was just us reading like you know bits of. Sun Tzu and going, fucking hell, he's right. God, it's so simple. Why can't I do it? Thousands of years ago, yeah. Yeah, legit, like, fucking, what is it, like, 4,000 years old? And this guy's going, don't spunk all your energy. And you're like, well, that's what I've been doing. I'm sorry, Sun Tzu. And that's, that's, the, that's the interesting thing, right? And that's what's cool about going back to that main point, which is probably, like, a reasonable place to, like, fucking cut this off, to be honest. But it's like, the, the lessons that we learn like by reading or through like moral fable or whatever, they do just sink in less than like, if you're going for a choke 
and you can't get it and you don't quit and then your arm's tired and then you have to let go and then they just peel out of it. You remember that so much more than, you know, a story about throwing people at a wall. Absolutely. That's what's cool about Jigoro Kano is he wasn't just a martial arts dude. He was a massive, uh, like, educator. Yeah, he was a teacher. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's, it's like, you, yeah, you learn these things through craft. But then he took that and he sort of, you know, founded different versions of pedagogy. And we'll look aside from the fact that at this period, schools were basically ways of indoctrinating children into being part of a military class. But, you know, let's. whatever. <laughs> yeah, let's. He, he still did it good. <laughs> Which again, we can all probably we can all probably learn from the fucking mistakes of history, can't we? Big time. As I say, that's one thing that's reminded me of is when you know people are screaming at each other and they can't take the other person's point and all of these elements. And that's why it's cool to read about like when he's talking about being broad-minded and being open-minded and how like you should be able to have two completely contrasting opinions in your head, but then be able to like unify them and then find the points between. But we just seem to be utterly unable to do that at the moment. Or like most people are anyway. Yeah. Anyway, judo. Ooh. Yeah, it was fucking good fun, dude. Yeah, I like mate, books. Like books are cool. <laughs> Fucking easy. Sorry. Yeah, judo is cool. <laughs> At times like these, like the fucking hell, I'm going to kill myself. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Can I do this entire thing again? Go on. It would also help if, it would also help if I wrote it in fucking English, wouldn't it? I literally just garble bullshit. Yeah. Oh man, I'm done. I'm fucking. I'm man, I'm so fucking. I need. I need. I need a fuck. I need a little lemon sip. Yeah, no, you sound like you're gonna fucking die, mate. Yeah, fuck. So, you sound like you need to fucking. You need to fucking look at some. Uh, look at some tomorrow. Oroko Oshire. Figure out. Yeah. Figure out where you're yeah. bleeding energy. Nice nah, fucking head cold, right? It's cool. Right. Um. Right. We done. You got anything else?